So this week, we're very excited to have Michael Hutchings of UC Berkeley, who's going to be giving an overview of embedded contact homology and obstruction bundle gluing. <coughs> All right, thanks for the introduction. Um, it's, it's exciting to see that so many people are interested in obstruction bundle gluing. I, I guess if you're stuck at home during a pandemic, then you're so bored that you'll do almost anything. Um, so th this, this cartoon shows the, the level of detail of my talk. Um, so this is not going to be super detailed. I just want to give an overview. Uh, and this will be um, this will be kind of a re partly a recap of, of things that other speakers have already explained. Uh, so if you were following this whole seminar and got a little lost, um, then maybe this, this will help sort of clarify what, what we're trying to do. Um, <clears throat> okay, so now I have to go to my actual slides. So over here. All right, so I wanna um, talk about what, what is embedded contact homology, at least a little bit, uh, and um, where does obstruction bundle gluing come into it, and a little bit about how it works. Uh, and I don't actually have that many slides. It says 32 slides, but I, I left a blank page after each slide that I can scribble on. So it's really only 16 slides, um, or 15 or something. Um, and we'll go slowly and please, please interrupt with questions because I'm not, I'm not trying to impress anybody with how much I know because I really actually have forgotten practically everything, but it, just, just try to, to help as, as much as I can. Um, okay, so let's review the, the basic setup here. Uh, so you want to define embedded contact homology and what it depends on is a, a three manifold Y close and oriented uh, contact form lambda. And this determines the contact structure C, which is the kernel of lambda, and also the field, which is in the kernel of D lambda. And it's normalized so that lambda var equals one. And then we're interested in the, the periodic orbits of the ray vector field, otherwise, known as ray orbits. And throughout this talk, we will assume that the ray orbits are cut out transversely or that lambda is non-degenerate. Um, you don't have to do that. So there are interesting things you can do like, like uh, UN is working on a more spot generalization, but I'm not gonna talk about that. Um, and then, although it's not really important for this talk, uh, ECH also depends on Gamma, which is a one-dimensional homology class in Y. Um, and we want to build a some kind of contact homology out of ray orbits and, and holomorphic curves. So to talk about holomorphic curves, we choose a almost complex structure J on the four manifold R cross Y. And we assume that J sends um, partial S, so S is the R coordinate. So it sends the derivative of the R coordinate to the ray vector field. It sends the contact planes to themselves uh, and it rotates positively with respect to D lambda, which is a symplectic form on C. And we assume that J is R invariant, so it's, it doesn't depend on S. And this is, this is the usual setup that one uh, makes to define any kind of contact homology. In general, you may, might need some abstract perturbations to talk about holomorphic curves, um, but we don't have to do that right now. Um, and let's talk about the chain complex generators. So we want to make a want to make a chain complex. Um, so you define an orbit set to be a finite set of pairs, alpha equals alpha i comma mi. The alpha i's are distinct simple ray orbits. So simple means you just you just go around the ray orbit once; it's not multiply covered. Uh, and the mi are positive integers, which you can think of as multiplicities. Um, if you like, you can think of this as a as a current. Um, and 
it has a total homology class, which is the sum of the homology class of each wave orbit times its positive integer multiplicity. And that's almost but not quite what a chain complex generator is. So an ECH generator is a generator like this where we add an additional condition, which is that if one of the wave orbits is like, so that means that its linearized return map has real eigenvalues, um, then it can only appear with multiplicity one. So every wave orbit has a linearized return map. If you take a, um, a, uh, a little disk transverse to the wave orbit and you take the wave flow starting at a point in that disk and follow it around, you get a map um, from this disk to itself to find in a neighborhood of the center. Um, and the derivative of that defines a uh, symplectic linear map from the contact plane to itself. And uh, this, it has um, eigenvalues whose product is one. So either they're both real or they're, or they're both um, uh, on the unit circle. In the case when they're real, we say that the orbit is hyperbolic. The other case is when they're on the unit circle, then we, then we say that the orbit is elliptic and the linearized return map in, in some coordinates is, is a rotation. Um, okay, so then the um, ECH is the homology of a chain complex, ECC. So it depends on all the data from the previous slide. So the Y, Lambda, Gamma, and J. And it's generated by the ECH generators in the homology class Gamma. And you can use Z coefficients if you like. Um, and I, I worked really hard to figure out the orientations for using Z coefficients. And then that's never been used in any application. All applications use Z mod two coefficients. So um, it's just, the first pass, you can ignore all this, all the signs. Um, now I have to talk about geomorphic curves. So this, you're probably used to hearing about J holomorphic curves. So a J holomorphic curve is a map from a Riemann surface to a almost complex manifold. Um, and when, when a holomorphic curve is embedded, or even when it's um, embedded except for isolated points or, or somewhere injective, um, then it's equivalent to just talk about its image. So you can think about it. You can think about it or some relative holomorphic curve as, as a submanifold, possibly with some singular points. Um, and then there are multiply covered holomorphic curves. So you can, if you have an embedded holomorphic curve, you can pre-compose it with some branch cover of its domain to get a, a, a um, holomorphic curve where, where each point in its image is, has several pre-images. Um, in that case, usually people care about the details of the map, like where are the branch points. Um, I couldn't care less. So all I care about is what the image looks like. I will keep track of its multiplicity though. So we define a J-holomorphic current to be a formal sum of CI is some somewhere injective holomorphic curve. And then I'm allowed to multiply it by a positive integer. So each CI is a somewhere injective holomorphic curve in R cross Y. So its domain is some compact Riemann surface, which you then puncture. And each puncture is asymptotic um, to well, either, either S goes to plus infinity or S goes to minus infinity. And then the Y, y part um, converges to some rape orbit. Um, you notice actually that this is, this is actually quite analogous to the definition of an orbit set. So an orbit set, you have a bunch of simple rape orbits with multiplicities. Uh, if I wanted to be more consistent, I could write this as a sum because that would be start to get confusing because we're talking about a chain complex. Um, and here, here I'm taking a, a bunch of holomorphic curves with integer multiplicities. Um, and then we can, we can look at a J holomorphic current going between two orbit sets. So they, they have to be in the same homology class or else 
no such current can possibly exist. Uh, so, so MJ of alpha beta denotes the set of J homomorphic currents um, where, well, roughly speaking, as the R coordinate goes to plus infinity, it converges to alpha as a current, or as the S coordinate goes to minus infinity, it converges to beta as a current. Another way to say it is, um, does this each each curve in this current has has some ends asymptotic to multiples of alpha i or beta j, um, and the total multiplicity of all those ends then multiplied by this di is is m i or n j. That's supposed to be a j. Oops. Uh, now. There's then something called the ETH index. So this is this is some integer which you can assign to every holomorphic current. It actually um, it's a topological number. It doesn't it doesn't matter that C is holomorphic. Uh, what this really depends on is just the orbit sets alpha and beta, and the relative homology class going between them. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to spend too much time explaining what all of this means. Um, so I gave a, I gave a mini course where I spent four lectures on this. Um, but I, um, my uh, lecture notes on ECH explain this in a lot of detail. Uh, so it's a sum of. Anyway, just to summarize, uh, it's a sum of uh, three basic things. So first of all, there's there's a first term class term. So this, this C tau of C, um, what it means is you take the um, contact structure over C, you think of that as a complex line bundle, and you take its, its first turn class, um, which I want to think of as a number. Like, norm um, like normally, if you have a line bundle over a surface, its turn class would be defined by taking a generic section and counting its zeros. Now there's a little problem with that when C is not a closed surface. So um, the, the number of zeros of a section can actually be anything because as you change the section, zeros can appear or disappear on, on the ends or boundary of the surface. Um, so to, to resolve that ambiguity, um, you, you wanna pick a section which on the ends is non-vanishing and trivial with respect to tau, or tau is some trivialization on the ends. And then this is a well-defined number. Uh, uh, Q tau, this is a relative self-intersection number. So again, if I had a, if I had a, a uh, two-dimensional homology class in a four-manifold, it has a self-intersection number that's defined by taking taking two surfaces representing that class and counting with signs how many times they intersect. I wanna do the same thing with C, but again, this, this is not well-defined without further choices because you can take different surfaces in the symbology class and intersection points can appear or disappear um, at infinity. So um, you can define this by requiring the, by taking two surfaces in the class and requiring them to be trivial in some sense at the ends with respect to tau and then count the intersection points. Um, and third, there's a bunch of Colony Taylor index. So each orbit alpha i, I sum up the Colony Taylor indices of its first mi iterates and I subtract the corresponding thing for beta. Uh, it looks like a weird thing to do. There, there's some motivation for this if you think about symmetric products of surfaces. I can explain that another time. Um, anyway, so there's some weird number. And now you can just wake up uh, if you fell asleep while I was explaining that. Just, just, just some number, it doesn't matter what it is exactly. Okay. Um, and the, the important fact about this number um, is that if we assume as always that our almost complex structure J is generic, and if I have a holomorphic current, then its ECH index is always greater than or equal to zero. Um, and if it's zero, if the ECH index is zero, then C is, is trivial in the sense that it, it's just 
Um, it's just a bunch of cylinders, which are products of R with wave orbits with some multiplicities. So in this case, alpha has to be equal to beta. And C, as, as occurred, it's just R cross alpha. So that, that's the only possibility of DCH index zero. Um, and then if the ECH index is one, then it's a little more interesting. So the current has, has two parts. So C0 is, is, um, is some trivial cylinders of multiplicity. And then C1 is an actually interesting holomorphic curve, which is disjoint from C0. Um, and it's somewhere injective and has, friend, actually it's embedded. I don't know why, that's another typo. So, um, Sorry, um, so yesterday I actually, I went into a store for the first time since April because I had to go get a flu shot in the pharmacy. Then while I was there, I grabbed a bunch of bags of candy and then I was high on candy while making my slides last night. So there's some silly errors in here as a result. Um, Right, so, so it's actually, well, it's what I wrote is true, but you can say more, it's, it's actually embedded. Um, and it has Fred Holman X1, which means that it, it lives in a one-dimensional moduli space of holomorphic curves. Um, if the ECH index is bigger than one, it can be more complicated. So, so you can think of the ECH index as some kind of upper bounds on the dimension of the moduli space, roughly speaking. So if the ECH index is negative, it's empty. The moduli space is empty. If the ECH index is zero, then you just have these trivial things. And if the ECH index is one, then you have these embedded curves in one-dimensional moduli spaces. Um, so we can then define the chain complex differential. So if alpha is a generator, then the differential of alpha is the sum over all generators beta of some coefficient times beta. And what's this coefficient? Well, you look at all holomorphic currents in the moduli space from alpha to beta modulo r. So r acts on this moduli space by translation because I assume that j is r invariant. And I, I only look at those curves for which the ECH index is one. And then, and then these appear in discrete, these are discrete points. This is a discrete set. Um, and there's, there's a compactness argument to show that it's actually finite, which I'll admit. But anyway, this is some finite set. And each element has some sign, which I denote by epsilon of C. So this is either plus or minus one. And then you add up all the signs and that's the coefficient of beta. If, if you're working with ZMA2 coefficients, then you can forget about the signs and just take the cardinality of this set mod two. So that's the differential. Um, and then where the heck, to, well, maybe before I go into the motivation, are, are there any, any questions about this sort of basic definition? Can I ask a question about the currents? Mm -hmm. Is, is this like, um, like I thought it was like the dual of like one forms, two forms. That's, that's what a current is. Does this make it easier to prove any kind of like compactness things where like formally it has a, a limit, which is a current and then, or is it just kind of a language thing? Um, so in my talk, I'm just using it as language, although um, actually in the compactness argument, um, this comes in handy. So there's a, there's, there's a compactness proof for holomorphic curves by Taubes, which just looks at them as currents. And the advantage of that is that you don't have to worry about their genus. Like normally, the usual compactness proof, you'd sort of have to worry about what the domains are and get the domains to converge to something. And to this proof, you don't have to do that. So that's actually used in the compactness argument to prove that this differential is defined. Um, but, may I ask you about what you mean when you say that we have an MI cover of alpha i? Does it mean that all those CI together um, like map in sum up the, the degree in the limit to MI? Yeah, so I'll draw a picture. I, I ordered a tablet and it has an, 
arrived yet, but I can I can scribble with my finger at least at least a, a little bit. Um, so so if you have a grave orbit alpha i here, um, let, let's say that m i is equal to three, for example. So I could have one end which is asymptotic to alpha i, and so this is. Yeah, this is an end of multiplicity one. And then I could have another end, which is asymptotic to the double cover of alpha i. And then because this, this works because uh, one plus two equals three. There I have an equation. Thank you. Um, other questions? Um. On your third bullet point uh, on the previous slide, are there examples of uh, of such C that are, you know, C0 plus C1 that don't have I of C equal to one? Um, sure, sure, you can. Um, yeah, so the, um, you could have, you could have a, a even without the C0, you can have a curve of Fredholm index one and its ECH index may well be bigger than one. Okay. Um, so in fact, the fact that its ECH index is exactly one puts, some, puts a lot of really strong constraints on it, some of which I'll tell you about a little later. Okay, thank you. All right, great, great questions. I like questions. Um, so, so one question is where the heck does this definition come from? Why are you defining this crazy looking thing? Uh, so the original motivation, um, it starts from a theorem of Taubes who proved in the nineties that the cyber wit invariance of a symplectic four manifold, a closed symplectic four manifold, I should say, uh, are equal to a certain count of holomorphic currents. Um, so, the theorem basically says that if I take a closed symplectic four manifold and I input a spin C structure S, so that's part of the data needed to define the side of Witten invariance, and that's equal to what Taubes calls a Grumov invariant of X omega and A. Um, so A is a two-dimensional homology class. The, um, the symplectic form defines a bijection between spin C structures in H2. Um, and then this Grumov invariant is a certain count of holomorphic currents in the homology class A, satisfying this equation. So, so the first term class of the symplectic form, or, or, or excuse me, of the tangent bundle of X restricted to C plus the self-intersection number of C is equal to zero. So you notice this thing looks a lot like the ECH index. So the, um, the ECH index was more complicated. It had, um, uh, so there's a first class and a self into number term plus a bunch of Conley Tainter stuff. So, so this is this is like that without the Conley Tainter, excuse me. Uh, this is like the ECH index without the Conley Tainter stuff. Um, and then there's there's Cyber Witten four homology, which is um, a counterpart for a three manifold, and it's the homology of a chain complex, roughly speaking. But the actual details are very complicated in, in Kornheimer Murphy's book. But, but heuristically, you wanted to set up a chain complex where the generators are R invariant solutions to the Cyber Witten equations in R plus Y. And then the differential counts non R invariant Cyber Witten solutions interpolating between two such R invariant Cyber Witten solutions. So, so the idea is I want to look at Taubes' Grumov invariant of a four manifold and try to think about what we mean for R by. So the the um, well the R invariant holomorphic curves are the unions of trivial cylinders. So that's where the ECH generators come from. Um, there's there's kind of a technical thing about why do we why do we require hyperbolic orbits to multiplicity one. Um, and this is explained in the ECH lecture notes. Um, and then the differential should count holomorphic curves where, well, 
you'd want the index instead of, be, to, instead of being zero to be one. So the ECH index is sort of an appropriate generalization of this number. Um, uh, the appropriate generalization of this number to R cross Y. So you have to define relative versions of C Y and, and self-intersection number. And then you have to throw in some colleague Sander index terms because that's, that's what you do in floor homology. Um, and then, so then Taubes later proved that indeed ECH is isomorphic to Sider Witten floor homology. Um, and um, the, the first papers on this actually didn't talk about contact manifolds. They instead talked about mapping tori of area preserving surface to homorphisms. And the theory there is called PFH or periodic floor homology instead of ECH. But the sort of generators and holomorphic curves and index are the same basic idea. Okay. Uh, I'd like to talk about partition conditions. Um, so this is this is where it starts starts to look actually kind of bad for the definition of ECH. So what's the problem? So let's go back to this picture here. So here I had I had a rave orbit alpha i with mi equals three, and and one way the holomorphic curve could satisfy the condition is you could have one end asymptotic to alpha i and a second end of asymptotic to alpha i squared. Um, and this is here that there's a partition of the number three. The partition is one, two. So in general, um, for each alpha i, you're going to get a partition of the number mi. That is a bunch of positive integers that add up to it. Uh, and the, the numbers in the partition are determined by the ends of the holomorphic curve. So then the question is, when you're, when you're defining your, your chain complex here, this just says, well, let's just count holomorphic currents with ECH index one. And you could say, well, which partition do you want? And the answer is, I don't know. Um, but this is actually, this is actually, we actually don't have a choice about this. So here's, here's what's going on. Um, so for each rape orbit, gamma, and for each positive integer m, there are actually some distinguished partitions of the integer m. There are two of them. I call them the positive partition and the negative partition. And they're defined as follows. So if gamma is positive hyperbolic, which means that the linearized future map has real eigenvalues, then both of these partitions are equal and they're just one, 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 one. If gamma is negative hyperbolic, then they're both the same. And you, you take a bunch of twos, and then if m is odd, you have to put a one at the end. If gamma is elliptic, then it's more complicated. Um, so what you do to define p plus, you draw a lot, you, you draw the line y equals, okay, sorry, let me back up. Um, so an elliptic orbit has a rotation number theta. Um, so, so like it describes how much you rotate around. A, a full rotation is an integer. So if I rotate, like a third of the way around, then my rotation number is a third. Um, if I'm assuming that all multiple covers of gamma are non-degenerate, non degenerate then the rotation number actually has to be an irrational number. Um, I'm gonna call it theta. So you draw the line y equals theta x, look at the largest concave path from zero, zero to m comma floor of m theta with vertices at lattice points that stays below this line, and you look at the horizontal displacements of the segments between the lattice points. Let me draw a picture of explaining what the heck I'm talking about. Um, hopefully this will work. Uh, it's pretty bad axes, oh well. I ordered a, ordered a tablet to draw in, but um, everybody else 
is also ordering a tablet at the same time, so I'm still waiting for mine. Because here's here's a um, not very good drawing of the uh, integer lattice. Uh, then we draw the line y equals theta x. Um, Okay, and let's so suppose um, suppose that m m is three. So here's here's I want to go zero zero to this lattice point. I want to take the biggest path, which is the graph of a concave function, which stays below the line. It's going to look like this. So the the Vectors in this path, this is the vector two comma one, and this is the vector one comma zero. So in this case, P plus is two comma one. Uh, and then the P minus is defined sort of symmetrically but going above the line. So I wanna take the minimal convex path to this point, and this one has just one edge. So in this case, P minus is just the partition three. So those are the, those are the positive and negative partitions associated to an elliptic orbit. And another example is that if the angle theta is positive and small with respect to M, then the positive partition is just one, 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 and the negative partition is just M. And then it's a fact you can prove, oh, this is another typo, that should say M is bigger than one. Um, okay, so if at the M is elliptic and M is bigger than one, these partitions are actually disjoint. They do not have any integers in common. Um, so if you're trying to, to find ECH, you might say, well, that's, um, that's disturbing because, um, well, what I, I wanna prove, well, oh, sorry, I, I forgot to say the key fact. So let me, I, I got ahead of myself for a second. Okay, so the, so the fact is that those partitions I just described are the partitions that appear in the curves with ECH index one. So if if C is well, let's let's forget about the the multiply covered trivial cylinders for a minute. So if C if C has no multiply covered components in ECH index one, then the for for each alpha i, the partition determined by the positive ends is exactly this positive partition I just defined, and the partition determined by the negative ends at covers of beta is the negative partition I just defined. Now, if I'm trying to prove that d squared equals zero, I want to glue together two curves with ECH at x1. Um, but that looks very bad because they don't fit. Um, so um, like if I have an example, an example I just did, I had an, an orbit where the, um, the negative partition is three. So that would mean that I'd have a single end, a single end co converging to the triple cover of the orbit, and, and the positive partition was two one. So I would have an orbit converging to the double cover, and an orbit converging to the single cover. And you can't glue those because they don't fit. So you're like, oh shit, um, maybe this this whole project isn't going to work. Um, so, well, I can uh, give away the, the um, ending of the story. It actually does work. Um, but but why, why does it work? Well, um, <clears throat> so, so it helps to think of gluing as kind of an inverse operation to breaking. So, so if I have a, a moduli space of index two curves, I wanna say, well, um, 
if this fails to be compact, what does an end of this moduli space look like? So if I take a, a non-convergent sequence in this moduli space that's, that's breaking, what, what does this breaking process look like? And what actually happens um, is you get building levels. So there would there would first be this um, level with um, I'll call it U plus, which has this um, triply covered or this end at the triply covered orbit. And there'd be a low le lower level, which I'll call U minus, which has these two ends, which we just talked about. And then there's something in between. Then what's in between is a branched cover of the trivial cylinder. So here's the trivial cylinder. Um, and we have a, th a three to one branch cover by a pair of pants. Necessarily exactly one point somewhere in the middle. And we'll call this thing sigma. Um, so that, that's what you see in the limit. So the, the um, the process going in the reverse direction is that I want to glue all this together. So I want to, I want to glue u plus to sigma to u minus. Um, so the, the right written in words. So I um, let let's just consider the case where there's just there's just one elliptic orbit under consideration, um, and I'm a some positive integer. So u plus is some curve. Well, let's not worry about ECH index one. Let's just say it's Fredholm index one and immersed. And it has negative ends that covers of gamma with multiplicities Q1 through QK. The sum of these multiplicities is M. And then U minus has positive ends that covers of gamma with some other multiplicities that also sum to M. And I wanna glue them together by inserting this curve sigma, which is a branched cover of R cross gamma. Um, sometimes these are called connectors. So you can think of it as like you're doing a plumbing project under your kitchen sink and you have some pipes and they don't, they don't fit because they're, they're different sizes or whatever. So you have to go to the plumbing shop to buy some little part which will connect them together. Uh, so you wanna glue these things together. And this is, this is where we need to use obstruction bundle glue. So that's, I'll say a little bit about how we actually do that. Are there any questions first? A uh, question. Hmm? In, in the partitions page, there was a theta and I sort of lost what that was. What is theta? Um, so, I have a ray gamma. You can take a little, well, Here's the contact plane at some point in gamma and the linearized return map to defines a linear map from the contact plane to itself. Here's this, I need some name for this point. Well, let's call that P. Um, so it goes from context structure P to itself. Um, and in the elliptic case, this map is a rotation. So, Elliptic means that for some, for some choice of coordinates on this contact plane, the map is a rotation by some angle. Um, and theta is that angle divided by two pi. Thanks. Other questions? So can I ask something? So you look at the moduli space of ECH index two things. Yeah. And and then the the compactification includes these things with these connector. Yeah. That's right. Okay, thank you. Okay. So let's let's obstruction bundle glue. So what do we do? So, so the, we've already had some talks about this. So this is kind of a recap. Um, 
or maybe in a slightly different setting. So <clears throat> where are we? We first have to pre-glue. Uh, so on U plus and U minus, we're going to pick some small section of the normal bundle and we'll perturb U plus or U minus a little bit in that direction. Um, and then psi sigma is going to be a small section uh, of, well, basically the normal bundle to the trivial cylinder, but pulled back to sigma. So, so in the picture, I'm, I'm moving sigma, but only in the, in the directions that are normal to the cylinder. So that, that basically, you can think of it being the graphics to first order anyway. And then I, I, I patch all these things together with some cutoff functions. So I perturb each piece a little bit and I patch them together. And I can say, well, is that thing holomorphic? So I can look at the cauchy riemann equation of this, of this pre-glued curve, and you can write it in a schematically like this. So it's beta minus times some piece theta minus, which is just defined on u minus, plus beta sigma times some piece theta sigma, which is defined as sigma, plus beta plus times some piece theta plus, which is defined on u plus. And if you can get all of these thetas to vanish, then d bar is equal to zero and you've got a holomorphic curve. So well, our, our goal is to try to find these sections, psi minus, psi sigma, and psi plus to make all these thetas vanish. Can so I, can I ask Oh, sorry, can I, can I ask a quick question here? I think it's probably pretty related to um, the previous questions about currents. Yes. So, so it seems that, um, I, I, I think this is important, but I'm not exactly sure, but it seems as though using the, using the currents in this setup, we were able to avoid any Teichmuller theory um, because there's, you can sort of write down the equations, but there's no um, perturbations of the almost complex structure appearing here. Um, Maybe can you say a couple words about that? Or maybe maybe I'm misreading things. You're can correct, I attempt right? an answer to this? Oh, sure, sure. I'll snap I, I, while well, you're okay. answering. Why, why, don't, why, don't, why don't you say something first? Because I think you might be about to say something completely different than I would, and I'm curious. Well, you're right. There's no Teichmuller theory because I'm just looking at, at subsets of the four manifold. I, I don't care where they live in the moduli space or Freeman surfaces. Um, yeah, so I would say something completely different. I think there is Teichmuller theory, which is suppressed due to the fact that he's perturbing in directions of the normal bundle rather than anything more general than that. So, yeah, so, so I think the, so my understanding what's going on is kind of, you can maybe pick a J, you, you kind of, you can perturb and then project like project the deviation from holomorphicity like onto the normal bundle. And then you just, you're just looking at kind of like the, the D bar, what you get out of the D bar is kind of a section of the normal bundle. And that kind of is independent of the, the J and the base. Yeah, well, the thing is that if you're, if you're only perturbing in normal directions, then the, the almost complex structure of the target manifold is going to uniquely determine the complex structure on the base for any, homomorphic curve you find. So I mean, that's, that's sort of a nonlinear perspective on it. Another way you can view it is one, and at, it ties into a question that, that I used to ask a lot, which I found very confusing, which is why, uh, how do you know that when you're only perturbing in directions of the normal bundle, you actually see everything you want to see? Uh, I think one way to answer that is you could set it up in a more general way that would be more complicated because you would need to take account of general perturbations in not only the normal but also tangential directions and you'd also need to allow perturbations of the domain complex structures at the same time and you could do the whole obstruction bundle gluing setup in that way and then 
when you write down the, the linear operator whose co-kernel forms the fiber of the bundle, you find its co-kernel is naturally isomorphic to the co-kernel of the normal operator that he's actually going to talk about which is why th that way of doing it gives you the same result as what he's describing. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, 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 yeah, so it's like, cause kind of like you, you could do like this Rube Goldberg thing where you end up with something which is the same that you had started out with. Um, um, another, another question related to this is I guess, so I guess in higher dimensions, you could probably also say, okay, we have a we have a tangent space, and you can form a normal bundle. Um, so does this does everything here work using the occurrence formulation in higher dimensions as well, or it's only a three dimension, three and four dimensional phenomenon? So, it, for my version of the answer, the currents didn't actually help us at all, uh, and I. I'm not sure, if, uh, Michael can clarify maybe, I'm not sure if, if it's understood what a holomorphic current in higher dimensions is supposed to be. I've seen a, a definition that makes sense in dimension four. Um, I, I think you can say what a holomorphic cur current is in higher dimensions, but I guess, yeah. But in case, I, I'm, I'm happy with Chris's answer. So basically there, you can you can either think of things as maps or you can think of things as as currents. Um, um, maybe it'd be more proper to do everything using maps, but that confuses me. So I, I think of things as currents. Um, Wait, I have a quick follow up. Yeah. So does this obstruction bundle gluing business work in higher dimensions? If you have an obstruction bundle, sure. I mean, this whole business of gluing uh, branch covers of um, the, the, well, does it still work in like, or is some somehow the counts of the linearized sections, the zero linear sections dependent on the fact that you're in three dimensions? No, not really. This is a, this is a very general kind of gluing strategy. Um, it could be used, I mean, you have to have a sufficient amount of regularity. Like you wanna have, you wanna have well-defined instruction bundle or else you're going to need something more sophisticated but the, but this basic idea of the like, taking perturbations and patching them um is is very general okay. yeah so what, what i would what i would add is I, I i agree that there's no reason in principle why such things can't be done in higher dimensions uh, but if you look at the proof i explained last week of of why the obstruction bundle in this ech setting is well defined it does use some distinctly low dimensional stuff involving winding numbers of asymptotic eigenfunctions. And that simply wouldn't translate to higher dimensions. You need to prove by different methods that the obstruction bundle you want to exist is well-defined. Okay, I see, thanks. Okay. So, um, kind of some to the business. Um, actual statement of unreadable, and it's in my second gluing paper with Taws, Proposition 5.7. But the executive summary um, is that you can uniquely solve for these size such that, so first of all, psi plus and psi minus are perpendicular to the kernel of D plus and D minus. So these are the linearized two bar operators in U plus and U minus. So, so because of transversality, um, each of these operators is index one and its, its kernel is given by just our infinitesimal R translations of the curve and it has no co-kernel. Um, so having this, having this particular kernel kind of like a gauge fixing so that we're sort of, don't have to worry about the ambiguity of, of R translation. Um, and I can get each of these theta plus or minus to be, to be zero. Theta sigma, I can't quite get it to be zero, which is sad, but I can get it to be zero up to an element of the co-kernel. So in particular, I can get it to be perpendicular to the image of this operator D sigma. So this is, um, this is the operator that gives rise to the obstruction bundle. 
Chris talked about it before. So it, um, it has, no co has no kernel, but it has a co-kernel. The dimension is, is twice the number of branch points. Can I add something about this? Um, related to what I said about the previous slide, if, if you were to set up everything where you're perturbing not only in normal bundle directions, but also tangential, then I think you'd have an extra condition here on psi sigma that it has to be orthogonal to the kernel of the operator uh, on, on the branch cover part, which is not an issue here because that operator is injective as we proved last week, since yeah. we're restricting to the normal bundle. Exactly. So, so the general principle, so if, you, if we apply this gluing strategy in some other situation to put a bunch of pieces together, um, that's this parenthetical node at the bottom here, is that on each piece, you can get a size perpendicular to the kernel of the appropriate operator, and theta is perpendicular to the image of the appropriate operator. In the case we're talking about, for u plus and u minus, the, the operator is surjective. So, so being perpendicular to the image just means that theta is zero, um, but, but psi is perpendicular to the kernel. And then for sigma, the kernel is zero. So, um, and it, but the co-kernel is not. So we get the theta is sigma is something in the co-kernel. Um, anyhow, so- Actually, sorry, I, as long as I've already interrupted you. I, one, one more thing I think is worth adding to this. There's, there's an even more general situation. For instance, if, you, uh, if you're trying to glue some nodal curve, not just broken with asymptotic ray orbits, but also with nodes, uh, then I think you need to look at it as that, not that you have a separate linear operator associated to each level or each curve, but that there is a total operator which is acting on the direct sum of the domains of all those operators, but stuff within that direct sum that satisfies incidence constraints for the nodes. Mm -hmm. and, and so that like this, this operator on a direct sum with incidence constraints, uh, the co-kernel of that becomes the, the obstruction bundle. This is something that I, I've been thinking about this recently for my own reasons and, and took me a while to understand this because I don't think anyone's written it down anywhere, but that, that has to be the picture. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, other questions about this? Okay. Um, so we can just sort of Re rephrase the, the previous thing in terms of the obstruction bundle. So, so we can let M denote the, the moduli space of your sigma. And this, we have to restrict the branch points to lie in some bounded region because it doesn't make sense for them to be sort of way up in the where you plus is, et cetera. Um, there's some chat, I don't know if that's a comment from you or not. Okay, great. Um, and then we define the obstruction bundle O over this moduli space of branch covers by setting O sigma to be the co-kernel of T sigma. Um, as we discussed, this is a vector bundle of rank 2B. And then the obstruction section inputs, inputs a branch cover sigma and outputs this theta sigma, which is the obstruction to gluing. So then, so, Wherever, wherever this section is equal to zero, the previous proposition gives us an actual gluing. And then there's, there's some further argument you have to make, which is that all gluings are obtained this way. And then, <clears throat> then the, the number of gluings is a count of the sections of S. And then if you tear your hair out trying to figure out the signs, which I did, and then nobody ever cared because everybody just uses, uses CMO2 coefficients, and I'm not bitter at all about this. Um, then you find that the, the sine count of gluings is the sine of U plus times the sine of U minus times the sine count of zeros of S. So to understand how many ways to glue, we were reduced to the problem of counting the number of zeros of S. 
it's now, um, well, this construction section S is defined in a rather indirect way through this gluing construction. So it's hard to figure out directly what it looks like. So the, the trick is to replace it by what we call a linearized section. That's maybe not the best terminology for it, but in any case, some kind of simpler section S0, which we can describe explicitly. And then there's a argument to show that the count of zeros of S is the same as the count of zeros of S0. And then we can actually count the zeros of S0 combinatorially. Um, <clears throat> and the setup I'm using is actually much more general than what's needed for ECH because we did, we did we did not require the curves to be ECH index one, and we didn't require them to satisfy the ECH partition conditions. So, so we get some combinatorial formula for this count of zeros, which depends on what the partitions are. And then when you, when you work through all the combinatorics, you find that this count is one when the curves satisfy the ECH partition conditions. And it's actually an if and only if, so if you put in any other partition conditions, the count will be either zero or something bigger than one. So you're like, phew, it all works. I actually had some, some other big picture reason to know that it would work. So I, anyhow, um, so let, let me just tell you what this linearized section looks like. Because this is a question. Um, so there's some without much loss of generality here. Um, let's not worry about that too much. Um, so, so you have to, you have to look at what, what does this theta sigma actually look like? Well, it's, it's the, the linearized operator applied to psi sigma. And then there's some terms which I'll denote by eta minus and eta plus. And these come from the cutoff functions. So, um, so to draw a picture, um, I have um, like here's u u plus, and and here's your sigma, and I have to. Um, this is a, this is a really bad picture. You're not going to be able to tell what the, what I'm doing. Um, any any there's a cutoff in beta plus. Um, which, um, which, which cuts off u plus. Um, so um, this, is, this is a very bad picture of the graph of beta plus. But you have to tilt your head 90 degrees to the left. Anyway, it's um, beta plus starts as one and then at some point it cuts off to zero. So in, in this region here, there's a, there's a term from the, but when you write down the Cauchy Riemann operator of the pre glued curve, there's a term which comes from the derivative of beta plus in the S direction. Um, and that gives rise to a term in this theta, um, which I didn't know about eta plus. And what it looks like is determined by the leading asymptotics of U plus at this end. And there's some similar terms, eta minus, arriving, arising from the derivatives of eta minus, determined by the leading asymptotics of the positive ends of eta minus. And then there's some additional junk. That's a technical term. Um, so as I learned, um, I, I actually, I know very little analysis. I can sort of help fill in details. But anyway, all I know about analysis is that you can calculate derivatives of some functionals, and then there's some stuff you want and so, some stuff you don't want, and you try to estimate the stuff you don't want to show that it's small enough that it doesn't matter. That's analysis for you. Um, so <clears throat> anyway, when we define the linearized section, we just throw out this junk. Just pretend it's not there. Um, so S0, well, 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 S first of all, it's supposed to be some element of the co-kernel. And I could say, well, what's, what's its inner product with some other co-kernel element? 
um, now the now this first term, well, it's in the image of the operator, so its projection to the co-kernel is zero. So I'm going to define the linear I section by just projecting the eta terms to the co-kernel and just throwing away the check. So schematically, the linear I section looks like you take the eta minus and eta plus and throw away everything else. Um, and you can actually compute this thing. So um, it turns out that if you have a co-kernel element, then sort of the asymptotics of a co-kernel element at a positive end of sigma live in the same eigenspace of the asymptotic operator as the leading asymptotics of the negative end of U plus that are described by eta plus. So, so this, this pairing sort of at each end, we're, we're pairing two vectors in the same one dimensional complex eigenspace. And then you can actually start to compute this thing. And then we want to prove that S and S0 have the same number of zeros. So what we have to prove is that if you li linearly interpolate between these two sections, then no zeros will disappear off of the boundary of the moduli space. So what we have to show is that on the boundary of the moduli space, the junk is small compared to S and S0. And then they have the same count of zeros. So that's, that's my uh, executive summary and time's up. So I'll stop and then we'll get into questions. We awkwardly all clap now. Thanks Michael for the wonderful executive.